we would now like to invite Dr. Tristan Smith, a member of our Emissions from Shipping SIG, uh, to present on the current developments of the IMO greenhouse gas strategy and the need for a rigorously developed evidence base in supporting policymaker debates which the IMRS actively contributes to at the IMO. Thank you, Tristan. Thank you, John, and uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you to the organisers for this opportunity to share some of what we've been doing, um, I suppose, in the name of IMRS at the IMO, in the International Maritime Organisation, in the d discussions that have been going on now for several years about greenhouse gases. And um, what I've decided to do is try and focus this presentation on the nature of the evidence that we've been developing, discussing in the SIG, and then taking to the IMO and deploying. And then I'll move on to some of the emerging questions, what this means given where we are um, in that process. It's not complete by any means. Um, before I explain that in a bit more detail, i just <laughs> better introduce myself. I'm an uh, academic and researcher at University College London. We have a group there which is focused on greenhouse gas emissions from the shipping industry within part of ECL called the Energy Institute, but we've developed a lot of work collaboratively across UK universities and industry partners um, over the last 10 years from a lot of UK government funding uh, to do with this topic. So the nature of this uh, problem is broken down into the three areas here. What needs to happen in the scale of shipping's greenhouse gas challenge? So similar to uh, the earlier presentation by Ralph, I'm not going to dwell on the climate science motivation for this. I'm going to skip onto the assumption that we all understand that, buy into it, and the IPCC's work. But what are the specifics of shipping's component of this uh, puzzle? And then, given those specifics, what does that really mean for the industry? What type of change might we expect? Um, and how much could that cost? Because m much of this comes down to questions of cost. And then, like I said, we'll move on to some of the emerging evidence needs because there might be many in the audience who have thoughts on those that I'd be very interested to hear about. So what's the scale of the challenge ahead? So there are two components that this boils down to very fundamentally. One is the expectation that we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions or CO2 emissions as a proxy by very substantial amounts in a very short period of time. That's what the graph on the left-hand side of this slide is trying to explain. So. We have wording in the Paris Agreement that says that we need to aim for well below 2 degrees um, and, if at all possible, 1.5 degree temperature, temperature stabilisation. And that graph, the blue and the red line, show CO2 trajectories for the whole societal problem of climate change and CO2 emission abatement, but translated into the quantities in the shipping industry if the shipping sector was to do a proportionate share of decarbonisation. So if, if we followed exactly the same trend as the average part of the economy, in order to hit 2 degrees, which is the blue line, or 1.5 degrees, which is the red line, those would be what the shape of CO2 emissions over the forthcoming decades would need to look like. The reason why I've got two lines is because of that ambiguity that we don't quite have this precise temperature target, but we do know that the minimum of Paris is well below 2, so it has to be well below the blue line and aiming towards the red line. The next part of the puzzle is the fact that we don't expect or want the trade uh, that drives the demand for shipping to reduce. There's a great desire to, for shipping to continue to prosper, for it to continue to do all the good work it does globally to service the needs of societies um, wanting food, fuel, um, commodities, manufactured products, and enabling us to have the standards of living that we have today. And unfortunately, that means that as we have growing population expectations and growing economic development expectations globally, uh, those two drivers give us expectations of growth in demand for transport or demand for shipping, which is the graph on the right-hand side. So somehow we have to square the challenge of reducing our CO2 emissions at very drastic rates with increasing trade. And in uh, in, in, in the sort of essence, that means we have to reduce shipping's carbon intensity or greenhouse gas intensity, if you like, very dramatically. Um, so we're going to try and frame this a bit in the concept of carbon intensity. So for those who are familiar with the IMO uh, metrics on this, that would be metrics to do with the amount of CO2 produced for every useful <coughs> unit of transport work or tonne mile uh, produced. So that's similar to metrics like EEDI, the design index, or the OI operational indicator, both of which measure grams of CO2 per tonne mile. And what we have here is a plot which actually was used as part of those IMO negotiations and shows, leading up to the debates in April 2018 last year, 
what a number of different um, interpretations of what IMO's responsibility or the shipping sector's responsibility should be to this decarbonisation challenge. Some were saying we should just hold the emissions constant at 2008 levels. Others said we should go for much more dramatic reductions, potentially even zero emissions by 2042, to make sure we were definitely in line with the 1.5 objective. And under one of the demand scenarios, so I'm used, assuming 3.4% demand growth uh, over time, under one of those demand growth, this is what would have to happen to the carbon intensity of shipping over the next three or four decades. Starting at the 2008 baseline at the bottom left-hand gr of the graph, we would expect a reasonable improvement, which we've already actually secured, about 25, 30, 35 percent, secured because of the period of slow steaming that happened from 2008 onwards as a result of the financial crisis. And then the predominant uh, focus on energy efficiency and cost reduction that's occurred as the recessions continued in many parts of the shipping industry or the pressure on costs has continued and uh, that's driven us to some increase in efficiency over the first um, 10 years of this graph and puts us in a good position today. The challenge then obviously becomes what happens over the subsequent three decades to get us to 2050, given that all of those curves on carbon intensity show um, the need to go to up to 100% reduction. And those upper sections of the curve are where the challenge really lies. So what we've done so far, this fantastic achievement really, um, of slow steaming, increasing ship size in many sectors, um, increased attention to design and operational efficiency, is giving us a good start, but it's leading us to this era where we have diminishing returns on further incremental improvements on efficiency. And subsequent to that, we need an era, era where we move to very low or zero carbon fuels, because having exploited the energy efficiency opportunity, the only thing that's left is to get the carbon intensity of the fuel, the energy source, lowered. And that's where this graph tells us, almost regardless of the challenge um, from a CO2 trajectory perspective, we need to go. And the message there was very important to that IMO negotiation because it basically spells out that even if you take quite a low ambition, keeping 2008 emissions constant, if you expect demand to grow at 3, three or 4 percent per annum out to 2050, then just the demand growth alone places pressure on achieving carbon intensity reductions, which is of the scale that can only be solved by zero emission fuels. And that understanding that was a key enabler for us to have a much more rational discussion about, okay, if, we, if it's going to mean change, regardless, what is it that we want to incorporate as the actual rate of change? What's the relative cost of all those different options? And the essence, the message behind this is that that scale of change by 2050 is of order of 75 to 100% reduction in carbon intensity. One of the things that our group and our colleagues have been doing for the last few years is trying to then translate those types of um, trajectories of ambition into technical detail for the industry. And this is one graph taken from one of the submissions made to the IMO, ISWG1 INF2, which was submitted quite early on in the process. And there's a piece of work done in collaboration with the Danish Ship Owners Association and actually articulates with a lot of their members inputting evidence on the various costs and opportunities, um, in, in, integrates that into a picture of what the, what the transition might look like for the sector. And this shows the fuel mix out to 2050 under the lowest ambition that I've talked about so far, a two degree scenario. So this is quite low relative to some of the higher interpretations. The colours in the graph show the types of fuels and their trends over time out to 2050, with megajoules on the y-axis showing the share in energy content of the different fuels. HFO, which is the dark blue sector and is also a proxy for the low sulphur fuels we'll have from 2020 onwards as we go into 0.5% territory, is obviously declining along with MDO. LNG, which is the turquoise wedge, has a small role to play. Biofuels, which is the yellow wedge, have a certain budget in our modelling here and that uh, shows that they could increase in role. But the real story in this graph, and the one that many have sort of anchored onto, is this emergence in the 2030s of something in this graph we call hydrogen, but it could be a number of hydrogen derivative fuels, which are essentially zero emission fuels, entering into the fleet from 2030, but growing very rapidly. And so with all of that evidence being deployed, the IMO debated last, last year in a series of intercessionals leading up to April 2018, and I'm sure many people are very familiar with the initial strategy for greenhouse gas reduction, which was then agreed in April. And essentially, 
uh, embodies, this is not a graph used in the initial strategy, it's our interpretation of what that means, embodies this trajectory. So we agreed to an absolute reduction of at least 50% emissions by 2050, which is the purple line on this graph, and then similar to that framing in the Paris Agreement of saying, if it's possible, we'd like to go further than that. So we have this concept of going to 100% uh, uh, GHG reduction in 2050 as, as an upper bound ambition as we go through the process. So if that's where we are heading, the next question is, uh, what does that really mean in detail? It's all very well, academics like me sitting in an ivory tower, drawing graphs about what it could mean and some magic hydrogen appearing. But what, does, what do we think this could actually definitely mean? And in order to answer that question, we've been working for a few years now on a series of publications with Lloyd's Register that I'm going to refer to here. This is not actually from the latest publication, it's from one from last year, um, where we were trying to evaluate in detail what the potential sort of options that were in that hydrogen box. And this shows seven different potential machinery and fuel combinations, ranging from full battery electric at the top down to biofuel at the bottom. And they're all applied as analyses of the costs for a 9,000 TU container ship, which many of you will realize is one of the more challenging and interesting ship types and sizes to decarbonize, given it's got a pretty large engine on to begin with, um, tens of megawatts as opposed to some of the smaller ships. So battery electric, um, sorry, I should explain this graph a little bit before I go into the detail. So what we've got in the bar charts is the component of cost for each of those different potential machinery and fuel combinations broken down into these four categories. So for some of these options, there are extra capital costs of the main machinery. So a fuel cell is more, more expensive than an internal combustion engine. That means that some of these, like hydrogen and fuel cells, the third option has an increase in um, capital cost of the main engine. Uh, but you can also have an increase in the capital cost of storage. So some fuels, again hydrogen, require cryogenic storage. That has quite a high cost, and that's obviously an increase in cost relative to the fuels that we store on board today. So that's why the purple bar is significant for a number of options, and particularly significant for electricity, because that's representing the capital cost of the batteries needed for a 9,000 TU container ship to sail the oceans just under battery power. And then we have the voyage cost, which is perhaps more intuitive. That's the added fuel cost, which is varying depending on the option. And then uh, something we call revenue lost, which is to do with the fact that many of these fuels are lower energy density than um, the incumbent heavy fuel oil. And so when you store them on board, you end up sacrificing some of your capacity, some of your cargo uh, hold space. And that means that your revenue potential for the given design is going to reduce. So we take that into account as well and quantify it for each of the options. And broadly speaking, I think we can rapidly take out the battery electric option for most of the deep sea fleet. And that leaves us with these other options of which um, quite often we are finding at the moment ammonia, which is uh, NH3, so essentially it's a hydrogen carrier, is quite attractive because it has lower capital costs of storage, but it depends on the precise, precise configuration as to whether it's better or worse than hydrogen um, in, in the assumptions used. And then biofuel, which as many would understand, can often be very competitive depending on where it comes from and um, what its price is. And biofuel is, is perhaps the most difficult because it's so hard to define its sustainability and its um, impacts broader than just its use as a fuel. So there are risks to how biofuel could find its way onto the um, larger economy's impacts, particularly on food prices. For that reason, a lot of the modelling we're doing at the moment um, for governments were being asked to assume that zero biofuel would be available for the shipping industry, which might be an assumption that some would like to question in, in the next um, question section. I won't go into this in detail, suffice to say we've spent uh, a lot of time building some really horribly complicated models to try and represent the dynamics that occur within the engineering choices, but also how those engineering choices represent the commercial realities of the industry, the way that ship owners make investment decisions or operational decisions about speed, and um, how that results in some take-up of technology and some um, some sort of emission consequence as a result. So I'm sorry for glossing over this. Uh, I'm not trying to pull the wool over your eyes, but I just don't think I've got time to do it justice. So if there are questions on that, I'll happily take them. But if you just assume for now there is this black box that we call Glowtram and whole ship model, which contains a lot of maths and assumptions and input data, and enables us to say, well, given the options that we were looking at on that previous slide, and a carbon price, what do we think might this mean? And how can we bend that curve of increasing CO2 emissions downwards? And what's that going to need from a carbon price perspective? <laughs>
And gradually, we run our models and we increase the carbon price. So imagine starting at zero, we get a business as usual trajectory, so growth in emissions. $50 a ton, maybe it comes down a bit. $100 a ton, it comes down a bit more, etc. So that's the process that we've been using in order to investigate the subject. And that needs some assumptions about what we expect as the backdrop against which we're evaluating how these trends will evolve. And I just need to show you those very quickly. Um, so we have different assumptions around the amount of bioenergy that might be available. We give the industry budgets. Some are low, some are high. And we have different assumptions about the incumbent fossil fuel prices, so how HFO, MDO, and LNG prices might evolve over the next few decades, and then particularly how hydrogen as a price might evolve over the next few decades. All the numbers can be seen here, but they're also in our IMRS IMO submissions. And this is one of the results so to give you the high-level message, what we find is needed is some price signal of a type that can trigger the competitive um, difference between a, a zero-emission fuel and a fossil fuel being closed over time. And the graph that we're looking here is sometimes called a marginal abatement cost curve. It shows the amount of CO2 reduction on the x-axis relative to the price of carbon on the y-axis. Now, before people interpret this as saying we're lobbying for carbon pricing or market-based measures, we're not. We're using this as an articulation of the costs associated with the shift. The actual policy measure that you would necessarily use to enable this change could be something different. It could be a mandatory fuel standard. It could be something very different from a carbon price. But it's just an articulation of how the cost on the sector might evolve over time. And broadly speaking, what this shows is that you have a portion of the graph which, just like our carbon intensity trend, starts with a period where energy efficiency is used to maximise and optimise the fleet's um, energy performance, so minimising the amount of fuel used. But once you've exhausted that, which doesn't really do very much in absolute emission reduction terms, you then have this plateau where there's a period for um, a penetration of zero emission fuels. And that plateau results in a very significant amount of um, carbon emission reduction, and then at the end, some period where it's actually quite costly to um, reduce the emissions because of the incumbent, fuel, incumbent fleet, the very older ships needing quite expensive modification. Biofuel makes that curve slightly easier to achieve if we have scenarios with higher amounts of biofuel available, but it doesn't fundamentally change the nature of the carbon price needed, which is of the order of $300 a tonne, in the scenario that we have, which has high renewable fuel prices. The good news is that if there are low renewable fuel prices, then those um, costs all come down very significantly. And in this graph, you can see the marginal abatement cost curve achieves nearly 90% reduction for something as low as nearly $100 a tonne on carbon price. So that would be approximately a $300 per tonne increase in HFO prices, if you want to put it in today's money, um, given that there's about three tonnes of CO2 on every tonne of HFO combusted. So there's still an increase in cost, and that needs to be taken into account, and it's a tricky part of the puzzle. So to finish off, I just wanted to move on to some of the emerging evidence needs, and where potentially IMRS has the greatest opportunity to contribute, because the IMO negotiations will unfold over the next few years. The initial strategy is set to be revised in 2023. There's going to be increasing evidence needs as we go through those debates to build on the work that has already been done. One of those is around the machinery and the installations on board that can achieve zero emissions. This is a photo of the installation of hydrogen gas tanks, high-pressure gas tanks, stored on a vessel, uh, Hydroville, built by CMB, the Belgian uh, ship owner. Um, it uses high-pressure gas with a Volvo Penta D4 engine, which has been very minorly modified in order to run 85% blends of hydrogen alongside a pilot fuel of diesel. It's a good example of how very substantial changes in emissions can be achieved with actually relative off-the-shelf technology today. But much of the puzzle is not just about how we install things on ships, and clearly that isn't an installation that you could take straight to a two-stroke on a large container ship, but where the fuels come from. And this is not something that the shipping industry itself has to solve, but I wanted to give two examples of where this is happening at the moment. One is this trial by Shell and ITM. ITM are a company that develops and deploys electrolyzers, which are means to convert renewable electricity into hydrogen. And they say that by 2020, this should be on stream. And they're actually using it to produce hydrogen that is then used in the refinery, because that's where we use a lot of hydrogen at the moment. But it basically demonstrates the underlying technology and improves our understanding of the costs of it as we go into the future. 
But the area that we think in our research is actually most interesting for shipping is the production of something called green ammonia. And this is an example of Yarra, who are one of the world's biggest producers of ammonia at the moment. Their facility in, Pil in Pilbara in Australia, where they are going to hopefully pilot in the next couple of years production of green ammonia in very small quantities to begin with in order to test and de-risk the potential to go to very substantial amounts of green ammonia production because actually the main consumers of ammonia today, the fertiliser industry, have exactly the same decarbonisation challenge as shipping and decarbonising ammonia production off the natural gas that's currently used today is something which is going to happen naturally in that industry and there's a great opportunity for shipping to take advantage of the economies of scale. To give you a feel, there's currently 150 million tonnes of ammonia produced globally and there's currently about uh, 200 to 300 million tonnes of fuel oil used in the shipping industry at the, uh, today. So whilst it's a similar scale of industry and we'd have to increase production of ammonia significantly, it's not of a dramatically different scale and something that we need to solve. And finally, just in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into the detail on this slide, but I wanted to flash up something from the more recent publication that we produced with Lloyd's Register called Zero Emission Pathways, or Transition Pathways, sorry. Um, a lot of the engineering detail then needs to evolve for us to do a more nuanced comparison of the relative costs and benefits and cost reduction potentials of all the different machinery and fuel combinations so we can genuinely guide the industry on its um, path to seek out the, uh, uh, the right solutions that are going to be needed to enter into the fleet very quickly. So to conclude, for almost any rate of decarbonisation, not just the ones that the IMO has now agreed to, zero emission fuels Need, uh, are needed in the industry and are going to need to mature in the next 10 to 15 years. That's a, that's a given. The period of fossil fuel use is, is ending very soon in shipping. Not completely because there'll still be some residual fleet using some fossil fuel, but new builds are going to have to be substantially zero emission from a very short period of time onwards. Any increase in energy efficiency that reduces the impact on transport cost of fuel um, energy cost uh, is very helpful. So I don't want to discourage anyone who's currently thinking very hard about energy efficiency improvement. It's, it's crucial to the enabling of what we need to do in the sector. It's just that it's not sufficient and so we've been concentrating a lot of our effort on that fuel question. Batteries look challenging for deep sea under current technology but we don't want to dismiss them entirely. There's maybe some magic battery technology that hasn't yet featured and could appear in the next 10 years. And so as a result we focus most of our attention at the moment on liquid renewable fuels bio, energy, hydrogen, ammonia, for example. The machinery options um, that are compatible with those fuels are multiple. So we could see conventional internal combustion engines actually continuing to be used. They can be used with ammonia and hydrogen, or conventional gas turbines or fuel cellars, um, either as dual fuel or blend, blend fuel solutions. And then there are technology advancements, potentially solid oxide fuel cells, some of you may know, could be used directly with ammonia and they could shortcut some of the cost, um, but they're still not quite at um, higher TRL levels. Other technologies may yet become uh, competitive. I don't want to dismiss the idea of some of the other blue skies concepts that are being thought about. And the supply chains of any of these fuels are at a very early stage and so crucial to couple with the understanding of the machinery as how those might evolve over time because clearly this has to happen very fast. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for not going into more IMO detail, but um, I hope that's some information on this subject. Tristan, uh, thank you again. Um, very hot topic, obviously. Uh, plenty of questions coming through, and we have time for a couple, so Bev, if you can please. Uh, yeah, our first question um, is about biofuels, um, and it's the question of the impact of deforestation to grow the amount of biofuels potentially required. So this is, I guess this question is, is why we're being told in a lot of our analysis and why we're also judging ourselves, it's better to not include any biofuel budget for shipping at all and assume that the only way to meet our future energy demands of the scale of hundreds to 200, 300 million tonnes of, of fuel oil equivalent is by synthetic fuels made with renewable electricity. You can scale production of renewable electricity in the way that you can't scale biofuels with the impacts on land and the land use change and the CO2 emissions associated with deforestation, um, none of which are attractive when you're trying to solve this fundamental challenge of climate change. 
So clearly, sustainability definitions need to be advanced very quickly so that we know that the biofuel that is being used, some of which isn't required to deforest, so for example, waste products like um, anaerobic digestion of waste to produce biogas is okay, it's not going to create a negative land use change. Um, but that is only a finite amount of uh, bioenergy, and um, the scales that we need in the shipping industry are large. And there will be competitors, as we all know. So the aviation industry has its eye on bioenergy as well. Most economists think that aviation will be able to pay a higher price and that strategically you're better sending bioenergy, what limited supply of bioenergy there might be into that sector with shipping meeting its demand in other ways. Thank you. And our, our next question is, do you see nuclear um, propulsion as part of a zero emissions future? This is one that comes up periodically. Uh, no is the answer and the logic is the operation of the global industry requires very high versatility. Ships are like taxis moving around the world, dropping into ports opportunistically to pick up cargoes. And if you operate nuclear, then you need to have very high um, certification that we don't think is realistically deployed for many countries. The only way I can see it working is if countries form pacts that allow them to put bilateral uh, nuclear powered services in place. So for example, the USA and China might agree to put a pact in place to operate a certain amount of nuclear propelled shipping because they've somehow de-risked it sufficiently for their government's uh, purposes and they're already familiar with nuclear power and are comfortable with the risks that they're taking when they operate ships in it. All of the economic analysis implies that it's also not going to make sense and that the economies of scale of building, if you do want nuclear building 100 megawatts of power on or gigawatts of power on land and using that to produce renewable fuels rather than sticking very large numbers of reactors on ships, having all the nuclear proliferation risks, having the risks uh, associated with accidents that might be associated with that and the economies or the diseconomies of scale associated with smaller reactors. Um, I hope that answers. Okay, we'll, we'll, um, <coughs> we'll move on there. Tristan, thank you very much again.